in this week's video, I want to talk about why you may feel that your photos are a little bit boring. Maybe you feel your photos look similar to everybody else's, they lack uniqueness, or they don't have like that impact that you like to see. This is completely normal for everybody starting out in photography and landscape photography, and it was also something I struggled with in the beginning. And I will of course talk about how you can overcome those mistakes so you can start capturing photos that stand out a little bit more. So let's get into the first part. The one thing that I find to be the most important within landscape photography that trumps basically everything else is to be at the right place at the right time. And this is actually a really, really good guideline to follow. Whether we look through my portfolio from Denmark, a country that is not famous for landscape photography, or my portfolio from Iceland, which is definitely a country known for landscape photography or any other of my galleries, what most photos have in common is the combination of being at the right place, point the camera in the right direction and clicking the shutter at the right time. So what is the right time to photograph? Although I would totally argue that a landscape photographer should not only rely on the golden hour, it is a fantastic starting point for every new photographer. The soft golden light has an ethereal and magical feeling to it that arguably ups the aesthetics of almost every imaginable scene compared to the same scene taken in midday, normal or natural light. Besides the golden hour, look for everything weather-wise that is actually interesting. Storms, fog, the blue hour and night with a clear sky. Basically every time of day where the non-photographer would probably prefer to stay home. Now, if you do find a photo in my gallery which has been taken during averagely boring conditions like a blue sky day with hard light, you'll likely find that I have benefited from one or more other techniques that makes it stand out. Techniques that I will cover in this video. And likewise, if you find a photo that has been taken at a less interesting location, you will probably find that it has been taken during interesting conditions or with one of the following techniques from this video. So part two, what are those techniques? Most pro or consumer level cameras are equipped with a so-called kit lens, which is usually a normal focal range lens that goes from let's say 18 to 55 millimeter on an APS-C sized sensor camera. And in full frame terms, that is about equal to 24 to 70 millimeter. With this focal range, you get what is called the normal perspective or a somewhat more natural perspective. And exactly because these perspectives and focal lengths are normal, they do not really make the photo stand out in the same way as the extreme focal lengths can do. And now, before the middle management photographer out there start attacking me for saying that you can easily take photos that are impactful and not boring with a normal focal range like 24 to 70, yes, I am not saying you can't do it. I am saying that a focal range in the extreme ends can help with the impact and make the photo less boring. For wide-angle lenses, it is all about creating that extreme depth where we exaggerate the diminishing perspective. Fancy words, I know. But it basically just means that any shape simply becomes smaller and smaller as it gets further and further away from the camera. So everything in the foreground is unnaturally huge relative to whatever is in the mid and background, resulting in a strong sense of three-dimensionality and depth. This has a very impactful effect on the viewer and helps battle a boring photo. Despite the not so interesting weather, the strong sense of depth from the wave in front of these Icelandic mountains makes all the difference. You get a very strong feeling of 3D from that diminishing perspective. And in this drone panorama from the same mountains, but photographed from another angle, the panorama effect, which basically widens the focal length and gives that sense of diminishing perspective, not just from the small peninsula in the bottom of the photo, but also because the middle mountain, Vesterhorn, stands out so much compared to the mountains next to it. And with these three photos of the same mill taken from different angles, you can see how the foreground grassy part, the mill and the sky takes up approximately the same amount of space of the photo. But you can probably also see how using a wider and wider focal length, we include more of the sky, but it especially also makes the mill more and more distorted. The right hand photo is much more in your face than the left hand photo. This doesn't mean it's better 
but it does mean it's more impactful and thereby less boring. For making interesting telephoto focal length photos, it is all about thinking layers and scale. Whereas the wide angle exaggerates the diminishing perspective, a telephoto lens, if applied correctly, can do the opposite. It can make background elements and foreground elements look like they're very close. If photographing from the right perspective, you can compress the scene. And this is called the effect of perspective compression. By using perspective compression, you can make some very impactful photos. Like lining a sunrise up with a tower, the setting sun with sea stacks, a comet with a foreground mill, and so on and so forth. It's basically only your creativity that sets the limit. And again, I'm not saying you cannot make interesting impactful photos with standard zoom lenses and normal focal lengths. You definitely can. A wide angle perspective, a telephoto perspective, photographing in the golden hour, at night, are like tools you can utilize to achieve a less boring photo. Just like the rest of the techniques I show in this video are tools you can use with intention to make your photos less boring. And what I also consider to be tools are the different compositional tools. I'll cover some of them in depth in just a moment. But if you do struggle with composition and landscape photography, be sure to check out my ebooks. With minimal text and tons of examples, they're super easy to read so that you can get to the point fast. In each ebook, I cover a whole range of compositional tools. And in the last chapter, I bring it all together. There are links to both the free light version and full versions down in the description of the video. And speaking of composition, one of the topics I also cover in my ebooks is to give a sense of scale to your landscapes. Doing so, I consider to be one of the most effective ways to making your landscape photos less boring. Giving a good sense of scale is independent of the focal lengths or lens you use. It is all about perspective and how you place something the viewer can relate the scale of the landscape to in relation to your camera. It can be a house, a car, an animal, or a human like I usually do. Let's use a person for these examples. The closer you place that person to whatever cliff, mountain, waterfall, tree, etc. you want to photograph, the closer you get to understanding the real size of said subject, and that is independent of the focal length you use. The only issue is that if you place the person too far from the camera, the person may end up being so small that you can't even see the person and then the effect is basically gone. In these two examples of the same waterfall photographed from two different angles, the person on the left hand photo is closer to the camera than the waterfall, whereas on the right hand photo, the person is closer to the waterfall than the camera. And this makes a massive difference in the perception of how big this waterfall is. Here's another example with two photos of the same waterfall. One wide angle and one zoomed in. Although you can see the whole scene in the wide angle photo on the left, you get a much better sense of scale on the perspective compressed photo on the right and arguably it is much more impactful. Not to say that the wide angle photo isn't interesting and has its own aesthetic values. Comparing these two photos next to each other, I find that the right hand photo is more impactful and less boring. In this example, I photographed in the middle of the day with a clear blue sky. I used perspective compression to make the background super impactful. The distance between myself in the foreground and the huge wave in the background is big. I'm super safe where I'm standing on this cliff, but it looks very impactful because of perspective compression. It would have looked even more impactful if I could make the distance between myself and the camera bigger. I just couldn't in this example. Here's a photo of the same mountain where I simply cloned out the person on the left hand photo. Without that person, the photo, aesthetically pleasing as it is, just does not work in the same sense. Having that person there gives a much better sense of scale and interest and thereby makes it a less boring photo. And remember, it is not about focal lengths. In these examples, I have used a wide angle and simply placed a person in the landscape. It's the distance between the person and the camera, the scene and your compositional decisions that gives a sense of scale, not your lens, or focal length. One of the best ways to avoid boring photos is to introduce some order. As humans, we are evolved to love order because order is predictable and there is hardly anything more visually orderly than reflections. You can make the entire photo one big reflection, you can break the reflection, or you can make parts of the photo a reflection. Still water or a very reflective surface of ice are your best options in nature, but a reflection doesn't have to be a mirror image. It can also be repeating patterns like the triangular shape of this mountain reflected or repeated in the foreground grass. So look for order 
and especially try and look for symmetry. Yes, sounds completely basic, but I have found over the years that it is the most basic techniques that usually makes the biggest impact. So the next thing that can ironically make your photos feel boring is to make the photos too complex. If the photographer has tried to include too much so that everything in the photo distracts from each other, or the photographer doesn't have made sure that there is like this one strong focal point or subject, it's very likely that that feeling of boredness comes from you as the photographer not making it clear what the viewer is supposed to look at. And if that is not clear, the viewer and probably also yourself will most likely lose interest of the photo. However, on the flip side, you also need to make sure that you don't make your photo too simple. There is a very fine line between a minimalist and impactful photo using the right amount of negative space to draw attention to your subject and a photo that is just a bit boring because it is too simple. It is a fine line and it is often very subjective. So the next thing that can make your photos feel boring or lifeless is a scene without contrast and color. And here I'm not talking specifically about colorless photos like black and white photos. They can be super impactful and not boring at all, but just meh photos. I took this photo of a sailboat in Greenland after sunset. This is the raw photo and it does not look at all like I saw this scene. At this moment, we had a beautiful blue hour with the light from the sun below the horizon bouncing off the atmosphere and lighting the scene and we still had a bit of pink hues in the background sky. Does this show in the raw photo? Nah. However, with a bit of editing, all the colors and contrasts just pop out at you. This is why we should raw to edit our photos. Whether you want to make it look like reality or make it a more personalized, stylized photo is up to you. But lack of editing shows and proper editing relative to your style and the specific photo you're editing makes it much less boring. It is usually the lack of contrast and color that makes the photo meh. And these are aspects of the photography process that you can do something about in the editing phase of the photo. Just be careful that you do not overdo it. And actually in all these cases, they are more contrasty and also more colorful than their straight out of camera raw versions. It doesn't matter if it is a more minimalist photo or a more complex photo, whether it is a photo with no direct light, one with direct light or a night photo. So. Lack of color and contrast makes a photo more boring and editing can counter that. If you do struggle with editing, be sure to enroll in my huge post-processing course, Photoshop for Landscape Photographers. If you are only used to Lightroom, it is easy to get started because I edit all my raw photos in Camera Raw upon which Lightroom is built. I introduce you to the programs, I share all my techniques with individual tutorials and I give on top of that 12 start to finish tutorials with different themes how to edit autumn photos, how to make monochrome photos, several tutorials on how to make complex blending in Photoshop, how to replace skies if you're into that, several tutorials on how to edit forest photos, and I've just added a start to finish tutorial on how to stack night photos, blend the foreground and background together so you reduce the noise very substantially. You can save 15% upon enrolling, that's $45, with the coupon code that you will find along with the link down in the description of this video. So the last thing I will cover in this video you can do to make less boring photos is to use different and optimal shutter speeds. One of the easiest ways in landscape photography to draw attention and make something unnatural and interesting is to use long exposures. Here I'm not saying using long exposures for the sake of it and just two minute long expose everything you see. Use it intentionally. If you are in doubt about how to do that, I'll link to a video all about shutter speed you should definitely watch after this video. Now I remember vividly when Sophia and I, we visited McWay Falls all the way back in 2016. And it was the first time where she borrowed my camera and the first time where I showed her how to make a long exposure. She, as a non-photographer, was mind blown that it was possible and so easy to make something that looked so unreal and different from reality. Although a long exposure is a somewhat basic skill for landscape photographers, it still does have a high impact and although it often softens the photo and makes it more ethereal, it also, for those reasons, evokes questions and a sense of mystery and thereby makes it less boring. If you want to learn more about composition or editing, 
be sure to check out the links down in the description of this video and else check out my video about shutter speed right here. And if you want to join a workshop in one of these exotic places, be sure to sign up for my newsletter to be the first to know. You can also check them out via my homepage and see what spots are left. I hope you can use these inputs, these tools I covered in this video to avoid making boring photos. See you next time.